So another day, another reading space. Hopefully my voice holds up. <clears throat> COVID is kicking asses out here. And I'm definitely not immune. So I'm not sure if I have it, but definitely my voice is very weak. But I'm going to go ahead and mute and find the audiobook. So the book we're going to start reading is called Black Awakening in Capitalist America. I'm going to go ahead and get that pulled up and put into the Jumbotron, and then I'll get started. Okay, I think I have it in the Jumbotron, and I'm going to go ahead and start recording this space for audiobooks. Again, we're reading Black Awakening in Capitalist America by Robert L. Allen. I'm going to be taking drinks throughout because, again, my voice is so sore. I was taking a long time to load. Whenever I'm like, oh, no, it lets me audio, uh, edit. I'm going to put audio books. So it's just one of those spaces where, like, you just read. <laughs> it's not meant for, like, a lot of people to be in. And let me see if my book is, there we go, cool. So this is gonna be the introduction of Black Awakening in Capitalist America. So introduction. The course of a social revolution is never direct, never a straight line proceeding smoothly from participating social oppression to the desired social liberation. The path of revolution is much more complex. It is marked by sudden starts and equally sudden reverses. Tangent, 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 tan I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> Tangibility victories and peripheral defeats, upsets, detours, delays, and occasional unobstructed headlong dashes. It may culminate in a complete victory, crushing defeat, or a deadening stalemate. It may enjoy partial success, but then be distorted by unforeseen circumstances. The final outcome is not predicted automatically by the initial conditions. The revolutionaries must contend not only with conscious reactionaries and counter-revolutionaries, but also with the subtle social di dynamics which act to stop or divert the revolution. The Black Revolt is no exception to this process. Black America is an oppressed nation, a semi-colony of the United States, and the Black Revolt is emerging as a form of national liberation struggle. But whether this struggle can be characterized primarily as a rebellion for reforms or a revolution aimed at altering basic social norms, even so basic a question as this cannot be given an unequivocal answer. Rebellion and revolution are interla interlated, but they are not identical, and no amount of militant posturing can alter this reality. It must be asked, are Black militant leaders simply opposed to the present colonial administration of the ghetto, or do they seek the destruction of the entire edifice of colonialism, including a subtle variant known as neocolonialism. The answer, as marked, is not immediately clear. The reason for this lack of clarity lies partly in the fact that militant Black leaders themselves are divided and in disagreement about what they are seeking. All speak of revolution, but revolution has come has become a cheap word in modern America. It is necessary to probe beyond oratory and rhetoric if one wishes to determine the substance and meaning of the Black Revolt. Initially, all, I'm sorry, initially about all that can be said with certainty is that aggressive Black anger, the distilled essence of 400 years of torment and struggle, has burst upon the American scene. It is almost as though the scales of history, unbalanced by the spilled blood of countless Black martyrs, heroes, were finally being set right by urban rebellions, which were directly comparable to colonial insurrections. The fact of Black America as a semi-colony or what has been termed domestic colonialism 
lies at the heart of this study. It is, at one and the same time, the most profound conclusion to be drawn from a survey of the Black experience in America, and also the basic premise upon which an interpretation of Black history can be instructed, I'm sorry, constructed. Many Blacks, as well as whites, will object to the use of the term domestic colonialism to describe what they prefer to call the race problem, in quotes. Some object because some object because they contend that the solution to the race problem, in quotes, is to be achieved by extending American democracy to include Black people. Racial conflict would vanish as Blacks are integrated into the American political economic mainstreams and assimilated into American culture. Of course, there will be problems, say these critics, but in the long run, this is the only feasible solution. Black militants and many not so militant Blacks respond to this objection by asking what is it meant by in the long run? Black people have been on the run in this land for four centuries. Even after their so-called emancipation, Blacks had to run several times as fast as whites just to maintain their status as impoverished and perennially exploited residents of the United States. These critics say the militants can cling to the myth of evolutionary change because they refuse to admit that for the oppressed victims of the United States, both at home and abroad, American democracy is nothing more than a sham, a false face which acts to hide the murder, brutality, exploitation, and naked force upon which the socioeconomic system of American capitalism is predicated. The critics deny the voices of protesters who, throughout the political history of this country, have indicted the masquerade of American democracy. They ignore a Robert Purvis, a Black abolitionist who more than 100 years ago vented his contempt for your piebald and rotten democracy <laughs> that talks loudly about equal rights and at the same time tramples one-sixth of the population of the country in the dust and declares that they have no rights which a white man is bound to respect, end quote. But certainly things have changed since those words were spoken. No, not so if one takes seriously the cries of outrage emanating from the supposed beneficiaries of change. Ernest W. Chambers, a black barber from Omaha, Nebraska, gave eloquent testimony to the illusory nature of racial progress, in quotes. When he told President Johnson's riot commission, we have marched, we have cried, we have prayed, we have voted, we have petitioned, we have been good little boys and girls. We have gone out to Vietnam as doves and come back as hawks. We have done every possible thing to make this white man recognize us as human beings. And still he refuses. The consequence of this refusal was a black revolt which threatens to grow into a full-blown revolution. The argument for democratization of the American social system assumes that there is still room in the political economy for black people. But this overlooks, for instance, the fact that Black unemployment normally is double the rate for whites. And in some categories, it runs at several times the white jobless rate. The jobs which Black workers do hold are largely the unskilled and semi-skilled jobs, which are hardest hit by automation. Government-sponsored retraining schemes are, at best, stopgap measures of limited value. Retraining programs are frequently unrealistic in terms of jobs actually available. People are trained in skills already obsolete. Realization of this fact led one female tra retrainee to exclaim, we are being trained for the female, I'm sorry, we are being trained for the unemployment. Let me read that again. Her quote was, we are being trained for the unemployed. Integration thus fails, not because of bad intentions or even a failure of will, but because the social structure simply cannot accommodate those at the bottom of the economic ladder. Some individuals are allowed to climb out of deprivation, but Black people as a whole face the prospect of continued enforced impoverishment. Increasing numbers will be forced out of the economy altogether. We're already living that. Black ten, blacks tend to blame whites as a whole for this situation, but not all American whites are blind to the implications of their country's history. Here and there, a Truman Nelson will speak out in defense of the right of revolution referring to the bitter lessons of the reconstruction and post-reconstruction eras nelson wrote it is no answer to this argument of the right of revolution as expressed for example in the u.s declaration of independence to say that if an unconstitutional act be passed the mischief can be remedied by repeal of it and that this remedy can be brought back 
brought about by a full discussion and exercise of one's voting rights. The Black men in the South discovered generations ago that if an unconstitutional and oppressive act is binding until invalidated by repeal, the government in the meantime will disarm them, plunge them into ignorance, suppress their freedom of assembly, stop them from casting a ballot, and easily put it beyond their power to reform their government through the exercise of the rights of repeal. A government can assume as much authority to disarm the people, to prevent them from voting, and to perpetuate I'm sorry, to perpetuate rule by a clique as they have for any other unconstitutional act. So that if the first and comparatively mild unconstitutional oppressive act cannot be resisted by force, then the last act necessary for the imposition of a total tyranny may not be. In sum, if there is no right of revolution, there is no other right our officials have to respect. Nelson's analysis is essentially right. And implicit in it are the conclusions drawn by Black revolutionaries that the American oppressive system in its totality is unconstitutional. That this same system long ago decided and still maintains that oppressed Blacks indeed have no rights which a white man is bound to respect. That the right of revolution is not something safely and scorned in the documents of Western history, but is indelibly inscribed in the hearts and souls of all men. But if all these conclusions are valid, then a violent conflict is in the offing. Peaceful coexistence is impossible if the contradictions are too great. It is precisely this possibility, nay probability of conflict and fear of its consequences, which motivates some to discount any talk of domestic colonialism and imperialism. For if it is admitted that Blacks compromise an oppressed nation, then it must also be admitted that as Blacks press for liberation, a violent and anti-colonial struggle becomes increasingly likely. Imperialist powers are not wont to relinquish gracefully and peacefully their proprietary claims over their colonial subjects. Hence, to take seriously the concept of domestic colonialism is to require a, revolu a revolutionary alignment on the part of those Blacks and whites who support the liberation struggle. This is not an easy thing to do. It is not easy because of the depth of commitment required. It is not easy because more than a willingness to engage in revolutionary action is asked. Another prime requisite is a willingness to study and to sort out the implications and repercussions of the revolutionary act. This means that the revolutionary must not only be armed with the weapons of his trade, but armed also with sufficient knowledge and political understanding to put those weapons to best use. Let me grab a drink right quick. All right. Of utmost importance for the revolutionary is a cogent analysis of the situation in which he finds himself. Many Black writers and spokesmen have tried to define and analyze domestic colonialism. Back in 1962, social critic Harold Cruz wrote, from the beginning, the American Negro has existed as a colonial being. His enslavement coincided with the colonial expansion of European powers and was nothing more or less than a condition of domestic colonialism. Instead of the United States establishing a colonial empire in Africa, it brought the colonial system home and installed it in the Southern states. When the Civil War broke up the slave system and the Negro was emancipated, he gained only partial freedom. Emancipation elevated him only to the position of a semi-dependent man, not to that of an equal or independent being. The only factor which differentiates the Negro status from that of a pure colonial status is that his position is maintained in the home country in which proximity to the dominant racial group. Malcolm X sought to relate the Black freedom movement to the general and anti-colonial revolt taking place throughout the world. After his assassination, this ideological work was continued by SNCC and later by the Black Panthers, which viewed Black people as an internal colony of the United States. At a meeting of Latin American revolutionaries in Cuba in 1967, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, elaborated upon this theme. We greet you as comrades because it becomes increasingly clear to us each day that we share with you a common struggle. We have a common enemy. Our enemy is white Western imperialist society. Our struggle is overthrow the system which feeds itself and expands itself through the economic and cultural exploitation of non-white, non-Western peoples, the third world. 
Black people in the United States are part of this third world, Carmichael said, and he continued. Our people are a colony within the United States. You are colonies outside the United States. It is more than a figure of speech to say that the Black communities in America are the victims of white imperialism and colonial exploitation. This is in practical economic and political terms true. There are over 30 million of us in the United States. For the most part, we live in sharply defined areas in the rural Black Belt areas and shanty towns of the South, and more and more in the slums of the Northern and Western industrial cities. It is estimated that in another five or 10 years, two thirds of our 30 million will be in the ghettos and the heart of the cities. Joining us are the hundreds and thousands of Puerto Rican, Mexican American and American Indian populations. The American city is in essence, populated by people of the third world, while the white middle class flee the cities to the suburbs. In these cities, we do not control our resources. We do not control the land, the houses or the stores. These are owned by whites who live outside the community. These are very real colonies as their capital and cheap labor are exploited by those who live outside the cities. White power makes the laws and enforces those laws with guns and nightsticks in the hands of white racist policemen and black missionaries, mercenaries. The capitalist system gave birth to these black enclaves and formally articulated the terms of their colonial independent status as as was done, for example, by the apartheid government of Azania. Sorry if I say that name wrong. In South Africa, which the U.S. keeps alive by its support. Perhaps the best starting point for an analysis of domestic colonialism was provided by J. H. Odell, an editor of Freedom Ways magazine. Let me grab a drink real quick. Okay. Generally speaking. The popular notion about colonialism is one of an overseas army and an overseas establishment set up by the colonial powers, power thousands. Oh, I'm sorry. Generally speaking, the popular notion about colonialism is one of an overseas army and an overseas establishment set up by the colonial power thousands of miles away from its home base. Thus, the idea of colonialism becomes identical with an overseas territory and strange unfamiliar people living on that territory. However, this picture of colonialism is a rigid one and does not allow for it for its many priorities. A people may be colonized on the very territory in which they have lived for generations, or they may be forcibly uprooted by the colonial power from their territory, I'm sorry, their traditional territory and colonized in a new territory environment so that The very environment itself is alien to them. In defining the colonial problem, it is the role of the institutional mechanisms of colonial domination, which are decisive. Territory is merely the stage upon which these historically developed mechanisms of super exploitation are organized into a system of oppression. Odell's central point is that colonialism consists of a particular kind of institutional or social system, and this system does not necessarily have to be tied to a specific disposition of territory. It can take a variety of forms of which domestic colonialism in this country is one. From this thesis, a working definition. From this thesis, a working definition and analysis of domestic colonialism can proceed. Broadly speaking, colonialism can be defined as the direct and overall subordination of one people, nation, or country to another with state power in the hands of the dominating power. Politically, colonialism means the direct administration of the subordinate group by persons drawn from the dominant power. Thus, in the classic African situation, European officials control the parliaments and governments of the colonies, Although there may have been some token representation of the indigenous population, effective power was in the hands of the European settlers. This political control was buttressed by a legal system designed to serve an interest of the white settlers. Europeans sat on the courts and operated the prisons, and white controlled legislative bodies made laws which carefully discriminated between settlers and native application. Under this legal system, There was no such thing as a native winning a case against a white man. Finally, this whole political and legal edifice was protected and maintained by colonial armies composed of white and native mercenaries or 
members of the indigenous population who have been press and gang, press gangs into service. These colonial armies were charged with enforcing undemocratic colonial laws and generally keeping the natives in a state of subjugation. If the status of the black population in the United States before World War II is examined, a situation strikingly similar to this colonial model is immediately evident, even after emancipation. In states where blacks constituted clear voting majorities, political power was usurped by whites. The brief reconstruction era was the only period when blacks held some measure of political power roughly commensurate with their numbers. This was done openly and blatantly without even the courtesy of a shamefaced reunification of the principles of democracy, principles upon which this country was supposedly founded. Legally, black people were always at the mercy of whites. The constitution decreed that slaves were not whole human beings and a separate system of laws was relied upon in meeting out justice to any unfortunate slave who provoked the ire of his master. Take another drink right quick. It's, each slave state had a slave code, which was designed to keep slaves ignorant and in awe of white power. Slaves were forbidden to assemble in groups of more than five or seven away from their home plantations. They were forbidden to leave populations without passes, and they could not blow horns, beat drums, or read books. I want to stop there right quick, because as he goes down these lists of like laws that were created to subjugate African people on um, stolen land, which is the United States, these laws, they have some of them today. I remember living in Tucson, Arizona, where if more than five Black people were around like any kind of street corner standing there, we were considered a gang. And police used to harass us all the fucking time. I remember getting arrested every fucking day at school because I guess instead of walking straight home, I would chill with my friends. And because there's more than five, we're considered a gang and can be treated as such. So that's the part where it says slaves were forbidden to assemble in groups of more than five or seven away from their home plantations. They were forbidden to leave plantations without passes and they could not blow horns, beat drums or read books. And I say about the beat drums is because I hope I get this brother's name right, but I want to say his name, this brother, young brother who was killed by this cracker named Jordan Dunn. I apologize if that is not the correct name, but it was a, I want to say Jordan Dunn was killed by this cracker because the cracker said his music was too loud. And he's not the only one. There's so many stories, which is so sad because it makes it difficult to, difficult to even keep track of the names that were killed in just in my lifetime, not to mention before I was even here. So yeah, all this stuff, just, if you if you listen to what he's saying, he's describing a colonial system during transit, during slavery, which literally we could draw parallels to today, which is why he calls us a colonized people. They were forbidden to leave plantations without passes. They could not have, they could not blow horns, beat drums or read books. Slave preachers were prescribed and hemmed in by restrictions and slaves were forbidden to hold religious meetings without white witnesses. Other provisions forbade slaves to raise their hands against whites and gave every white person police power over every Negro, free or a slave. That's important. Every cracker got a privilege over Black people, Black men, women, and children. Like, so that means you could be the poorest of poor au fait, mistreated by all the upper class au fait and other uh, classes of au fait that might be just a little bit well off than you. You don't have a pot to piss in. But you knew in your heart of hearts, while you existed as a white settler on this stolen land, that at least you could take out all your anger and ire on Black people, no matter what, and never be held accountable. The system of slavery, the system, I should say, the system of whiteness literally creates sociopaths. And we don't talk about that enough, but I have a bunch of books that I'll definitely read for audio so people can listen to whenever. Our provisions pervade slaves to raise their hands. Oh, I'm sorry, I already read that. For reconstruction, these slave laws were in effect reinstituted in the form of the infamous Black Codes and segregation statutes. Under these codes, it was a crime for Black people to be idle. In some states, any white person could arrest any Black person. In other states, and you know what? And you see that in their bloodline. Because how many times will Black people would just be chilling, minding their own goddamn business, and a regular asshole will come and ask them what they're doing? Do you live here? Well, let me see your key. Just, and you're like, what the caucasity? But it comes from a literal privilege bestowed upon them under white supremacy. And this is what we mean by describing white supremacy. It's not saying 
that a white person is superior in any way, shape, or form. We're describing a system in which power is divvied up among whites to subjugate non-whites in order to keep their reign superior around the globe, a hegemony, if you will. So yeah, it was a crime for black people to be idle. In some states, any white person could arrest any black person. That's why I say in a post-revolutionary society, man, if you don't want to fucking work and we don't need to work, we shouldn't have to. Like, we really need to interrogate in which we've been indoctrinated with work. I'm not saying work is not necessary. I'm saying the way in which we relate to work is literally slavery. And if we want to build a new society, we cannot allow that to carry on to the next without dismantling it completely and redefining it for the will of the people. In some states, any white person could arrest any black person. In other states, minor officials could arrest black vagrants and refractory and rebellious Negroes and force them to work on roads, levees, and other public work without pay. Special provisions in other states forbade and or limited the black man's right to own firearms. Right up through modern times, laws such as these were vigorously enforced against blacks, even though the laws, in quotes, may not have been formally inscribed in any code book. That's important because when we talk about where we are, George Jackson says we're in fascism now. Like we, America is a fascist state. And there is this hyper like focus and let's put our energy in creating more laws, laws they don't even follow to begin with. But the fact that they don't necessarily need a law, the system is already clear and entrenched for centuries. White supremacy is the rule. Capitalism is the rule. And they'll enforce it as violently as they need to. So that means if we're going to strategize a revolution, a resistance against it, we have to do so by, like Michael Mack said, any means necessary. Behind the political and legal framework of domestic colonialism stood the police power of the state, the state militia and the U.S. Army. As if this were not enough, an informal colonial army was created by the Ku Klux Klan and other white citizen groups. It was the armed terrorism of these groups that helped in successfully undermining reconstruction. And anyone who has lived in a modern, in quote, black ghetto knows it is no more, I'm sorry, it is no mere figure of speech when the predominantly white police forces which patrol these communities are referred to as a colonial army of occupation. Colonialism is not, however, a system of of domination and oppression which exists simply for its own sake. There are very, very specific factors which account for the creation and continuation of colonialism. Colonialism enabled the imperialist powers to rob the colonial people in a variety of ways. They were able to secure cheap land, cheap labor, and cheap resources. They were free to impose a system of low price payments to peasant producers of exports and crops, export crops, to establish a monopoly controlled market for the import of the manufactured goods of the colony owning power, the goods often being manufactured from the raw materials of the colony itself. A secure, I'm sorry, a secure a, and secure a source of extra profit through investment. Certainly not all of these specific factors were operative under the American form of domestic colonialism, but general economic motivation was of utmost importance. The colonial subjects were transported from their native land and brought to the mother country, in quotes, herself, which would be America. There, they became a source of cheap labor for a rapidly expanding economy. In large measure, the foundation of American capitalism was built upon the backs of Black slaves and Black workers. That's why it's so important that this campaign we're seeing from right-wing think tanks of misinformation, just outright lies, right, about what slavery is and how it started. Sadly, it's been going on for so long that you even have currently in our present times, you have black people talking about there was no slaves from Africa. There, I mean, just falling behind the white narrative and being as loud as wrong as possible. And there's very real consequences to that. Because if you don't know where you are and how you got here, you're not going to understand why you need to get out. And what's sad is that you're going to have kids and those kids' kids are not going to know because you had nothing to hand down to them to tell them to be free. And you can say the words freedom, but if you don't understand what makes you enslaved, what you're in, then you don't know what freedom is either. The colonial subjects were transported from their native land and brought to the counter, the mother country herself. They became a source of cheap labor for the rapidly expanding economy. In large measure, the foundation of African-American capitalism was built upon the backs of black slaves and black workers. 
as with other colonial peoples, the, col the colonized Blacks were prevented from developing a strong bourgeois middle class, which would engage in widespread economic activity and compete with the white masters. Instead, the Blacks were restricted to providing unskilled labor in the production of raw materials, e.g. cotton, for export to northern mills and foreign consumers. But colonial colonialism does make for some class divisions within the ranks of the colonized. In fact, colonial rule is predicated upon an alliance between the occupying power and indigenous forces of conservatism and tradition. This reactionary alliance was made in order to minimize the chances that the colonial power would have to resort to brute force in preserving its domination. This was an early version of modern pacification techniques. Thus, the colonial power played tribes off against each other and used traditional tribal chiefs as puppets and fronts for the colonial administration. In return, the Rajas, princes, sheiks, and chiefs who collaborated with the colonial powers were rewarded with favors and impressive sounding, but usually meaningless posts. Hence, although colonialism is defined as direct rule of one group by another, it does nonetheless involve a measure of collaboration between the colonists and certain strata of the indigenous population. Under American domestic colonialism, since the African social structure was completely demolished, the beginnings of class division had to be created among the slaves. The most important such division was between the house niggas and the field niggas. The former were the personal servants of the masters. They were accorded slightly better treatment than the field hands and frequently collaborated and consorted with the white rulers. Vestiges of this early social division still can be found in black communities today. Another important collaborator and force of conservatism was the black preacher. The black minister remains today as an important, if not the most important social force in most black communities. This is because historically the black preacher was the first member of the black professional class, the black elite. He frequently had, no matter how small, some degree of education. He enjoyed a semi-independent economic status and he had access to God-given truths which were denied to ordinary blacks. Consequently, he was highly respected and looked upon by the black community as its natural leader. While it must be said that, that the black church has performed an essential function in maintaining social cohesion in black communities through decades of travail and suffering, it cannot be denied that the black preacher is often identified as an Uncle Tom, in quotes, a collaborator. He is seen as a traitor to the best interest of his people. This is not a role which the black minister consciously assumed. Like the modern black middle class, he is torn with conflicting loyalties, sometimes drawn to his own people, sometimes drawn to the foreign rulers. The ministers accepting Christianity also in some degrees identify with the major moral values and institution of white society. Consequently, it was relatively easy for him to work with whites, even though this sometimes amounted to betrayal of blacks. In general, the black community experiences little difficulty in seeing white so-called morality for the hypocrisy and can't that it is. Yet the black middle class of which the black preacher is only the most conspicuous part, conspicuous part, as the artificially criticized stepchildren of white society acts as though it is driven to uphold the society's values and attitudes, even when whites fail to do so themselves. Colonialism is more than simply a system of political oppression and economic exploitation. It also fosters the breakup of the native culture. Family life and community links are disrupted and traditional cultural forms fall into disuse. Under domestic colonialism, this process is even more destructive. Slave families were completely shattered and cultural con continued, sorry y'all, this is a hard, it's an easy word, but I stumble over it. Cultural continuity, <laughs> all right almost totally disrupted. The Blacks who were kidnapped and dragged to these shores were not only stripped of most of their cultural heritage, they soon lost the knowledge of their native African language. languages. They were forced to speak in the tongue of the master and to adopt the master's culture. In short, Blacks were the victims of a pervasive cultural imperialism which destroyed all but faint remnants, chiefly in music of the old African forms. Hold on real quick. Okay. Despite the analysis just made, there will still be those who object to the application of a framework of domestic colonialism to the internal structure of the United States. Their chief argument is that Black people more and more are being granted the same political rights as those ac accorded to whites. 
the passage of a host of civil rights laws and their enforcement, even though less than vigorous, clearly supports this conclusion, it can be argued. It must be admitted that there is some merit to this argument. Certainly the situation of Black people has changed in recent years. However, whether this can be counted as anything more than a mixed blessing in this is the subject matter to be investigated in this book. To be more explicit, it is the central thesis of the study that Black America is now being transformed from a colony nation into a neo-colonial nation, a nation nonetheless subject to the will and domination of white America. In other words, Black America is undergoing a process akin to the experience by many colonial countries. The leaders of these countries believe that they were being granted equality and self-determination, but this has proved not to be the case. Under neocolonialism, an emerging country is granted formal political independence, but in fact, it remains a victim of an indirect and subtle form of domination by political, economic, social, or military means. Economic domination usually is the most important factor, and from it flows in a logical sequence other forms of control. This is because an important aim of neocolonialism is to retain essentially the same economic relationship between imperialism and the developed countries as has existed up until now, means to keep them subjugated. As especially instructive example in the methods of neocolonialism is provided in the case of Ghana. Ghana became an independent country in 1957 and projected throughout the progressive world the hope that all of Africa might soon be composed of free nations pursuing an independent self-determined course to economic development. Kwame Nkrumah, the new nation's leader, was known as an outstanding opponent of colonialism and a champion of African unity. In 1966, Nkrumah was overthrown in a bloodless coup in the face of neocolonialism, a neocolonialism which has been active in Ghana since independence was exposed. Briefly, Ghana achieved formal independence, but the government's belief that foreign financial and economic institutions could provide the vehicle for economic development resulted in Ghana's being subservient to foreign capital. Ultimately, a coup was prompted by the contradiction stemming from the situation. Until 1961, government passivity and reliance on foreign economic institutions was Ghana's economic development strategy. For example, cocoa is Ghana's chief export product. The owners of Ghanaian cocoa farms are Ghanaian. However, the prices paid to cocoa producers and the export of cocoa were controlled by the British-dominated Cocoa Marketing Board. The CNB was set up in 1948 obstinately to protect the cocoa farmer from the uncertainties of the world cocoa market and to provide a reserve fund which could be used to develop the country's economy. In actual operation, the CNB served as a convenient way for Britain to drain off Ghana's surplus capital, meaning they advertised the CNB, again, the cocoa marketing board, as a way to like protect the cocoa farmer's interests, but in actuality had function in, re in reality is that it was just stealing their money and stealing their resource and exploiting the farmers for their labor. Let me grab something to drink real quick. Imports from Great Britain into Ghana were controlled by the United Africa Company, a firm which was active in several African countries and which accumulated yearly net profits higher than the tax revenues of most of them. The UAC, because of its interest in maintaining its market for foreign imports, adopted a, ta yeah, a tacit policy of containing or taking over itself any independent manufacturing operations which threatened to get under underway in Ghana. So basically, if they tried any kind of self-determination in Ghana during this time, Britain made sure that that didn't happen. The UAC, because of its interest in maintaining its markets for foreign imports, adopted a tacit policy of containing or taking over for itself any dependent manufacturing operations which threatened to get underway in Ghana. Consequently, the UAC played a prominent role in preventing the development of a genuine and strong native capitalist class. Rather, Ghanaian capitalists were kept dependent on foreign capital and foreign economic institutions. That is what Black capitalism looks like under white supremacy, y'all. That's what capitalism looks like, period. But those of us who are trying to adopt this whole Reaganite view of, oh, we just need to have what they have and paint it black. No, this is what that looks like. Exploited, depressed, not allowed any kind of self-determination, constantly controlled, and basically slaves. So no, black capitalism cannot lead to your freedom. 
it is just slavery. This entrenchment of huge amounts of foreign merchant capital, coupled with the fact that foreign owned banks largely controlled the availability of domestic investment capital, assured that Ghana could not be economically independent. Sick. In 1961, Ghana sought to break free of the grip of neocolonialism. An increasing balance of payments deficit, dwindling financial reserves, and failure to attract new foreign investment capital forced the Ghanaian government to search for a new development strategy. The government adopted a new seven-year plan, which held out socialism as a goal. However, by socialism, the ruling convention's party, People's Party, meant merely a set of techniques and institutions which enable rapid economic progress and economic independence in the face of a colonial heritage. It did not mean the restructuring of property relations and the reorganization of the whole mode of production, which is normally identified with socialism. In any event, the change came too late. Ghana's economic condition had deteriorated dangerously and a new military bureaucratic elite was preparing to replace the old political elite of the CPP. This new elite believed that by consciously acting in favor of the old colonial power, instead of flirting with socialism, and by proclaiming its intention to govern in the name of austerity and efficiency, it could resolve the economic problems with which Ghana was afflicted. So basically, the, this new bur, uh, bureaucratic elite that wanted to take over this military bureaucratic uh, elite were like, man, if we just do what the colonial powers say, we can make it work for us, at least some of us at the top, more so than socialism. They felt like flirting with socialism was provoking white hegemony because, of course, whiteness is uh, capitalism. That's the mode in which they operate and enslave the world. Socialism is for the people to liberate themselves. So, yeah. In any event, the change came too late. Uh, oh, my bad. The new elite believed uh, flirting with socialism. My bad. I lost my place. Oh. But in reality, this new elite was simply pursuing in revised form the old policies which the CPP advocated until 1961, and Ghana remains a victim of neocolonialism. One further point deserves comment. Neocolonialism is a form of indirect rule, which means that there must be an agency in the indigenous population through which this rule is exercised. That's really important because we have been heavily indoctrinated to like do this whole representation thing. We see a black judge and we think that's progress. We see black cops and we think that's progress. We see a black president and we think that's progress. I am a firm belief and I believe my analysis is correct in this, that whenever you see the indigenous people or the colonized population start occupying spaces of authority on behalf of whiteness, that is just another stage of colonialism, which he describes and many others have as neocolonialism. And that to me shows that you actually gotten worse because now those who organize resistance, organize strategy, analyze the conditions, right? They now have to go out and radicalize the people, not only that the system is fucked, but the faces that they've been taught to worship that look just like theirs is actually out to get them too because now they're on the side of whiteness. That is incredibly hard. To, to work through. And again, as the time goes on, these issues get compounded while colonial, colonialism stays, you know, mutating and transforming. Oh man, we got work to do. Let's see. Neocolonial, neocolonialism is a form of indirect rule, which means that there must be an agency in the indigenous population through which the rule is exercised. Fitch, Fitch and Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer sorry, in their study of Ghana noted that the colonial governments yield administrative powers to the natives only when vital British interests are reasonably secure. These natives must show themselves willing and able to serve as post-colonial sergeants of the guard over British property. Rubber in Malaya, land in Kenya, oil in Aden. Uh, I'm not sure how to say that one right. Looks like. I've been saying all the words wrong anyways. In British Guyana, when no cooperative stratum has yet emerged, independence, in quotes, is delayed. Meanwhile, element hostile to British interests are liquidated, shoved aside, or co-opted. The problem for the British in colonial Africa has been to shape a native ruling class strong enough to protect British interests, but still weak enough to be dominated. The Nkrumah po political elite served for a time as just such a in quotes, native ruling class, even though the members of this elite were militant nationalists. When Nkrumah wrote to this reality and attempted to reverse himself, 
he was soon ousted from office. In the United States today, a program of domestic neocolonialism is rapidly advancing. It was designed to counter the potentially revolution revolutionary thrust of the recent Black rebellions in major cities across the country. This program was formulated by America's corporate elite, the major owners, managers, and directors of the giant corporations, banks, and foundations, which increasingly dominate the economy and society as a whole because they believe that the urban revolts pose a serious threat to economic and social stability. Led by such organizations as the Ford Foundation, the Urban Coalition, and National Alliance of Businessmen, the corporatists are attempting with considerable success to co-opt the Black Power Movement. This strategy is to equate Black Power with Black Capitalism. In this task, the white corporate elite has found an ally in the Black bourgeois, the new militant Black middle class which became a significant social force following World War II. The members of this class consist of Black professionals, technicians, executive professors, government workers, etc., who got their new jobs and new status in the past two decades. They were made militant by the civil rights movement, yet many of them have come to oppose integrationism because they have seen its failures. Like the Black masses, they denounced the old Black elite of Tommy preachers, teachers, and businessmen politicians. The new black elite seeks to overthrow and take the place of this old elite. To do this, it has forged an informal alliance with the corporate forces which run white and black America. We're actually seeing that in real time, a micro of the macro on the app, which is funny because a lot of these talking points like FBA, Secure the Tribe and all those weird ass alphabet groups literally get their talking points from a script from Stormfront that was on the internet all over the place and they got their script from Mein Kampf, which is Hitler's book, right? Now this stuff was disseminated through white right wing think tanks, a lot of them front groups that are labeled and categorized as hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center. So I encourage people to go look at the Southern Poverty Law Center. One of them is named PFAIR, is literally registered as a white supremacist front group. The person who created PFAIR's name is John Tennant. No, that Ofe is dead. May he burn in hell. But his work still lives on and his strategy still moves forward. So that's something we need to study. Yvette Carnell, Tariq Nasheed, all these people, right, who come out with these talking points, all of a sudden Black people are supposed to be against uh, immigration. It's not just in America. We see it with Operation Dadula in South Africa. That is all by design because they understand that the conditions are getting so bad out here. Like so many people are uh, are living paycheck to paycheck in jobs that used to be like secure, not only not even 20 years ago, are now something that, you know, people can barely eat on. So those conditions are getting bad. They have no interest in easing your burden or your pain because they know your work exploited. What they're afraid of is that you'll organize and rebel against it one day. So in order to prevent that, there must always be division and infighting. Hence a Tariq Nasheed. And Yvette Carnell, I mean, Tariq Nasheed himself even said that he quoted a NSA strategist saying that we need to get Black Americans and Africans in fighting or they're going to have a they're going to form a, an alliance that can potentially be for Black liberation. Tariq said this and now currently is now xenophobic and being paid by right wing think tanks and still has followers. This stuff is right in front of our face. We're literally failing an open book test because they have not really changed these things. And there's so many people who've written about it to say, hey, this is what happened in our time. Learn from this shit because we're going to need to break free. The new Black elite announced that it supported Black power. Undoubtedly, many of its members were sincere in this declaration, but the fact is that they spoke for themselves as a class, not for the vast majority of Black people who are not middle class. In effect, this new elite told the power structure, give us a piece of the action and we will run the Black communities and keep them quiet for you. Recognizing that the old Negro, Negro leaders have become irrelevant in this new age of Black militancy and Black revolt, the white corporatists accepted this implication, I'm sorry, the white corporatists accepted this implicit invitation and encouraged the development of constructive, quote unquote, Black power. They endorsed the new Black elite as their tacit agents in the Black community and Black self-determination has become, I'm sorry, has come to mean control of the Black community by a Native elite which is beholden to the white power structure. Thus, while it is true that Blacks have been granted formal political equality 
the prospect is barring any radical changes that Black America would continue to be a semi-colony of white America, although the colonial relationship will take a new form. But this is getting into substance of the study. To understand the meaning of this process and how it has come about, it is necessary to recall the events of a summer day when a new phrase was thrust into the popular American vocabulary. So I'm going to stop here. That was the introduction. The next space will be on section two, the social context of Black power. Like I said, it's a really good, important book, and I'm, I'm getting it, um, you know, recorded. So yeah, I'll try to keep it consistent with the spaces. Hopefully tomorrow I can pick up where I left off. So yeah, I'm glad y'all made it. Hope y'all enjoyed it. And I'll probably read maybe when I get home. I'll try. So y'all take care. And again, let's get free. The book is in the Jumbotron. Please, you know, share it, read it yourselves. And we'll have a discussion next time if y'all want. But yeah, this book is going to get more into not only your conditions, but a real radical strategy on how to fight and overthrow that. We need to start talking about that more because this shit is happening. You are in the midst of it, but you also have the power to dismantle it. So I just wanted to say that y'all be easy and let's get free.